Excellent. Okay, so let's get started. Um, can, is there any way to confirm that the overflow room can see me? Great, thanks. Okay. So I'm deeply honored uh, to introduce you to a truly extraordinary researcher and scientist, Dr. Warren Washington. Dr. Washington is a distinguished scholar at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, NCAR, in Boulder, Colorado, where he has spent his entire professional career since the 1960s. An internationally renowned and pioneering climate scientist, Dr. Washington was first recognized for his work that began at NCAR where he developed global climate models to predict the future impacts of climate change. Using the laws of physics, his team created pioneering, visionary computer systems that could simulate changes in the global atmosphere, land and oceans with unprecedented scope and accuracy. His early models enabled scientists to calculate the impact of increasing greenhouse gas emissions and were instrumental to the findings of the 2007 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Assessment Report, which was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, and of course to the preceding and ones that have come since. Dr. Washington fundamentally changed the way that we understand global climate by using computer modeling. He's one of our most accomplished alumni at Oregon State University. Thank you for joining us for this lecture. A Portland native, Dr. Washington earned his bachelor's degree in physics and his master's degree in general science, specializing in meteorology at Oregon State. He has said that he was first inspired to pursue climate science while a student in the College of Science when his physics professor offered him a job operating a weather radar station on top of Mary's Peak. That job experience and his phys physics education um, at OSU set the trajectory for his career. After OSU, he continued at Penn State University where he became the second African American to complete a PhD in atmospheric sciences in 1965. For more than 50 years, Dr. Washington has built an international national reputation as a leader in climate science. More than a pioneering researcher, he sought to share the critical findings of his work with those who can make the most difference. He has had presidential appointments in the Carter, Reagan, Clinton, and Bush Jr. administrations and served as chair on the National Science Board from 2002 to 2006, and he had a much longer tenure on the board than that, but that was as chair. In 2010, President Obama awarded him the National Medal of Science, the nation's highest science award. With a stellar career spanning more than half a century, Dr. Washington's principles have withstood generations of technological advances and remain fundamental to atmospheric science today. He continues to break barriers and achieve excellence. Earlier this year, he was co-awarded the Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement, sometimes referred to as the Nobel Prize for the Environment. Dr. Washington is the first African American to receive the prize in its 46 year history. We're honored to count Dr. Washington as an alumnus of the College of Science. Last night, we recognized him at our annual alumni award ceremony with the 2019 Lifetime Achievement in Science Award for the advances he's made to numerical modeling of global climate. He's brought honor, distinction, and visibility to Oregon State University. Thank you, Dr. Washington, for your extraordinary and lasting contributions to science. Please join me in welcoming back to campus Dr. Warren Washington, who will share the historic development of climate models and the geoengineering of the Earth's climate. I'm going to take you through a, a long sort of story about my life and about advancing climate modeling. <clears throat> I think that this is a subject more complicated than can probably be well done in just 40 minutes or so. <clears throat> oh, is It's also here. It should be in both places. Okay. Do what? You can go. It's on your 
Okay, thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Good. Okay, well, I'm going to talk about something about the, the development of climate models and something about geoengineering of the Earth's climate. Um, geoengineering is a very difficult subject because, and controversial about whether it would actually work. <clears throat> but I think there are a lot of people trying to figure out are there ways that we can do things better so that we use less fossil fuels. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the overview of that and a brief history of com com computer modeling. I just want to, before I get into the details of that, I want to point out something that was recently discovered, that Eunice Foote discovered the greenhouse effect in 1856, way before John Tyler did. And all she did was put some, some uh, vessels outside on a very clear day and, and put uh, additional carbon dioxide or, or, or moisture into one of the, of the two vessels and found out that those vessels were amplified that had greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide, water vapor, and more, more dense atmosphere. So she registered on the temperature. She didn't understand how it actually happened because she didn't have knowledge of the, of the physics of, of absorption and emission of, of greenhouse gases. But she just did these experiments. And I like to quote her because women aren't always given the proper credit in the sciences. And, and she, she was really ahead of the, of the whole work. In fact, she spent her whole life campaigning for the, the women's rights to vote in addition to her science. Here she is here. Uh, she was three years ahead of John T uh, Tyndall. She, she, she found that the carbon dioxide was the, uh, was the, had the, the, the largest uh, effect. And then she speculated in this paper of hers, which is only a few pages long, she, inspected, she speculated that if you increase the greenhouse gases in the, in the environment, it's going to cause global warming. So she was way ahead of her time. <clears throat> this is John Tyndall who came in 1861, and he had a more elaborate process where he used a tube and used a Bunsen burner instead of the sun as a way to, to warm up the, the uh, gas. And very elaborate sort of, of uh, laboratory uh, capability to I'll measure how much of this and that uh, I gave you uh, on the on the greenhouse warming. <clears throat> now shifting temporarily to climate modeling on the laws of physics. <clears throat> were fairly well known even in 1904. And, uh, and they are essentially equations which govern the dynamics of the atmosphere, ocean, vegetation, and sea ice. And, and, the, and the equation is going to be put into a form that can be solved on, modding, on, on modern multiprocessor computer systems. And so you, um, we've elaborated on these models enormously from the early days, but the, fundamentally, they were using the, the basic laws of physics, chemistry, and biology. <coughs> Excuse me. The, the, the first uh, sort of description of how to solve these equations is shown here. I won't go through the details of these equations. <laughs> But they're basically the old F equals MA for those of 
and the first law of thermodynamics, and there's an equation that we did for the conservation of, of mass for, and, and the gas, on the ideal gas law. So this was first expressed uh, in a verbal form in 1904 by V. Birkness, and then a, 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 a scientist in England by the name of L. F. Richardson solved these equations by hand as an ambulance driver during World War I. It turns out that he was, it was fairly idle in World War I warfare. They were, everybody stayed in their trench and then one, every once in a while they'd get up and climb out of their trench and, and try to get to the other trench, uh, the other side. So he had plenty of time and he was a Quaker. He didn't want to take part in the war explicitly. Uh, but, but he wrote a book about this, and, and we basically followed that book. Uh, and it's, it's still quite relevant. Uh, and then these two gentlemen at the bottom, Jewel Charney and Norm Phillips, uh, simplified these, these equations to a form that they could actually carry out a climate experiment, and they, and they did. Then in, in the next few years, there were several groups that were formed. Uh, uh, on, the, on the top one has Suki Manabi and, Jewel and, and Joe Smagorinsky at the Geophysical Fluid Dynamic, which is part of NOAA. There was a group at, at UCLA under Yale Mensk and Arakawa. Then there was a group the, uh, a one-man group at, 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 at Livermore, and that was Chuck Leith, and um, myself, and, and Akura Kasahara at, at, at the, the NCAR site. And so people were sort of experimenting with, with how to do this or that in the, solving these equations and trying to, uh, trying to work out different mathematical schemes. I arrived at the right time, I think. <laughs> and here's an, a, a uh, schematic of what's included in these models. And we have different types of clouds, cirrus clouds, uh, stratoculous clouds, uh, uh, we have clouds of all types, based mostly on the moisture and, and close to, to being saturated. Uh, and then we have uh, included river flow, oceans, ocean uh, topography, and vertical mixing, and circulations. I'll show some examples of this later on so that they've gotten much more complicated. Oops. Now, if you have a, a modern climate model and you to keep track of, of, of the different types of trees uh, on the rain f through the, the leaves and branches, a supplementation, a melting of thermal floor, even, even uh, 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 very complicated root dynamics based upon the type of soil and, and uh, all of that. So the, we have different types of trees. Uh, we have heat flux going in and out of the land and bedrock even you know, taken into account in various parts of the world. So um, we have leaf leaves that come out in spring and, and de decay. Uh, and we have all kinds of, of things. Even forest fires are included, with certain assumptions, of course. And here we just show on the schematics of, the, of, the, of things that are going to change and have been changing for a long time. Oops. 
Okay, there, there are two views, let me get this here. There are two views on global warming, climate scientists versus skeptics. I should point out that in some of my talks, like at the University of Oklahoma, as I was walking down to, to give my, my lecture, the, on the dean walked with me and he said, I have the police here, Warren. <laughs> so don't worry. Anyway, I ended my talk and somebody jumped up and started screaming and yelling. And they, uh, they, they actually uh, were taken out, <laughs> this, this gentleman. And I, I hate to say this, even, even, even nowadays, I get an occasional death threat. Uh, but that's just part of the, of the situation that we're in. Uh, the last one who, who did that left, uh, you know, left his, his telephone number, which I turned over to the FBI. <laughs> and the FBI informed me that, that they'd known about him already. And, we, they have to keep an eye on him. <laughs> and he's not from, from any place too far from here. <laughs> now, here's the, the, the 10 indicators of, of a warming world. <clears throat> if we hear, if we look at, at things like the uh, air temperature is going up. So that upward air, water vapor is going up. Temperature over oceans is, is, is also going up, or increasing, I should say. Sea surface temperature is increasing. Sea level is going up. Sea ice is going down. Ocean heat content is going up in terms of the amount of heat. Uh, glaciers and, and ice sheets are increasing and, and are, are actually decreasing, I'm sorry, uh, is decreasing. Snow cover is decreasing. And the temperature over land has been increasing, some of it, and heat waves and, and things like that. Well, one of the early things that people wanted to sort of know, oops, is, is, a, is the solar radiation changing much? Is that the cause? Here, on, on, we can measure from satellites uh, the, the solar intensity. And as you can see, there hasn't been any big trend in, in, the, in the solar intensity over the last 30 years or so. Uh, it could be a factor over longer periods of time, but, uh, but, but most of the solar people don't think that, that there's going to be any quick changes in the amount of solar energy we, we receive from the sun. And we do know that uh, in the past and the, and the projected changes in global sea level are fairly co constant and increasing with time. And there have been a number of studies essentially showing the, the proxy data, which is the, the older data based upon crude methods of, of measuring sea level, and the tide gauge data and the satellite data. And this is, if you, on the last part of this, if, if there's more uh, warming going to the end of the century, we'll be increasing sea level by something like uh, four feet in the worst possible case. So that's going to mean it's going to affect some people who might still be in this audience at that time. Uh, this is global warming. Uh, and we're, we're sort of seeing this. And we are trying to understand some of these ups and downs in the, in the global warming. Uh, and, 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 and part of these can be affected by uh, volcanic activity. Uh, but we don't have good measurements going back until after the, the uh, on the Second World War. But we have good measurements now and using different techniques. Oops. <laughs> I 
I'm, I'm giving a preview here. Uh, here, Elmer is showing that the, 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 that the warming is taking place uh, mostly in the last sort of decade or so. And we're expecting on the, the, this year to be uh, in that same group of, of, of very warm temperatures. And, and the gas, uh, on the greenhouse gas emissions are, are approaching uh, our, our 50 million metric tons of CO2 and other, other gases. <clears throat> And you can see where the, on, the, uh, on the damage is being done already that, that we see most of it taking place in the Gulf area. Uh, and this is partly caused by stronger and stronger hurricanes. Uh, and, and even though here in the, in the Northwest, uh, there's, there's interpretations of, of of uh, fire, forest fires, and so forth. So anyway, it's costing on the nation roughly uh, $300 billion a year, and that's going to go up. Now, people haven't taken that into account <clears throat> in the past. Now, a few years ago, I was asked, uh, I gave a lecture at Stony Brook, and uh, apparently uh, my work was quoted in, in, in Time Magazine, or I mean Newsweek, actually. And, uh, Pres and uh, President Bush's chief of staff, John Sununu, sent in a letter to the editor and uh, I didn't think it was correct. And so I sent a telegram back and I tried to correct some of the things that was just in, in his uh, uh, letter to the editor. I, uh, and when I got home, I got a call from John Sununu, the chief of staff, inviting me to come to Washington and talk to the cabinet, which I did. And then I went to a private meeting with the science advisor in his office, and he said, I want to run my model a a on your model on my, on my compact 386 computer. <laughs> uh, I explained to him that we were running on Cray computers at the time, the world's fastest computers. And so he, I think we convinced him that, that he ought to kind of tell us what he wants and we'll run it. And he said, no, I don't trust you guys. I want to run it myself. Well, I, he's running the government. You'd think he, would, he, would, he wouldn't have time for that sort of thing. And anyway, um, the science advisor, uh, and said, don't worry, Warren, he'll forget about it. He's so busy. And then it turned out that uh, the science advisor, Bromley, Alan Bromley, uh, uh, called me up and said, can you get him off my back? <laughs> the news uh, on New York Times and the Wa uh, Wall Street Journal, other ones had heard that I was working on it, but I kept my. <laughs> I told them that, that I'm not interested in embarrassing anybody. Um, so I, I, I agreed to get him a one simple model that he could do some experiments with. But it, it was an uh, interesting change to be giving advice to the chief of staff. And I don't think George Bush, H.W. Bush, knew that this was going on. Although I did meet with him later in, in 1989. Uh, another person that I inter interacted with was Margaret Thatcher. She, she was coming to 
Washington, or to Aspen, if you wanted to stop in Boulder and have a lecture uh, from climate scientists, and I was picked to be the, the person because I was in charge of the climate program, and she wanted a one-hour lecture. And so she came, and after one hour of getting a kind of a, a lecture sim similar to what I'm talking about this evening, this afternoon, <clears throat> she, uh, uh, her science advisor stood up and said, well, I've got to go. We have another appointment. And she pointed, just like she's pointing now, at my view graphs. There were view graphs in those days. She said, I'm not leaving here until I see every one of those. <laughs> Everybody calmed down and sat down. <laughs> and I didn't allow the press to be there because I didn't want them to embarrass her if she had said something stupid or something like that. Because the press would pick up that rather than the fuller significance of her coming to and wanting to, to learn. And everything went very well. And she sent me a nice photograph of her and a few, few nice words about uh, that she learned something about climate change. This is the, the person who will probably be affected most by climate change, <clears throat> our children, our children and grandchildren. It's unfortunate, but this is, this is the case. Even though that we're trying to find ways to geoengineer the planet and also cut back on emissions, we're not doing it fast enough. Uh, clearly, uh, the, the Paris Accord, which most countries have agreed to, except for Donald Trump, uh, and we aren't making the progress that we should be making. But I think that people are finding ways to get around it. And one of those areas is geoengineering, which I'll talk to you about. I think I've already, uh, let me give you some examples of, of simulations that we're capable of doing now. Now this is a ocean model, a global ocean model. <clears throat> and the way to look at it is the Gulf Stream is way over here. It's very realistic depiction of the ocean simulation. And the, the horizontal resolution is one-tenth of a degree of latitude and longitude. And here is the Kuroshio current, and then there's the uh, waves right along the equator. I'm going over, over here, you see them here. And if you look at it, you can kind of see it warms up in summer and, and then cools off in the winter time, and then vice versa. So even with today's capability and finding waves virtually, eddies uh, virtually everywhere, we do a pretty good job of capturing many of the ocean features in our high resolution version of the model. So. <clears throat> And we have lots of ocean data to compare with because uh, we have these floats that go into the ocean and drift through the ocean taking measurements, popping up to the surface and, and, and sending data to satellites and then going back down. <clears throat> so the ocean capability is remarkably good, I think, in, in comparison to other 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 parts of the atmosphere. And I want to show another one. It's, a, it's from the NASA model using satellites from space and, and, and climate modeling techniques. <clears throat> what you're seeing here is uh, uh, dust from the Sahara Desert drifting across the Atlantic and affecting circulation. On these white areas here are sulfur aerosols caused from the, the, the burning of fossil fuels. 
And you see that there's long streaks. So this is quite realistic in terms of the flow. Here um, we keep track of the burning of the forest fires or, or, uh, on the tropical forests here, also over South America and Africa. <clears throat> Here's uh, from sea spray, uh, very realistic circulations in the ocean area. And so we have all of these data sets now that are being put into our models <clears throat> through interactive uh, chemistry and making uh, our capability to, to be a lot better than we had in, in the early models. <clears throat> Here I show the Paris Accord, and uh, which I think 149 uh, countries have, have have agreed to, and the, the biggest emitters are are China, of course, 28 percent, the U.S. 15 percent, the rest of the world 20, 21 percent. And then individuals of the, some of the smaller countries, or not smaller in size, but number, uh, of essentially putting out emissions from fossil fuels. <clears throat> so this is, uh, is, I think that even China now is starting to cut back in, in a more substantial way. <clears throat> so it's leaving on the US now, probably <clears throat> one of the largest. This is what we can expect if we don't do anything. This is this is worst case scenario. The warming that that will take place by the end of the century is is something that you see in this dark red over the land areas and especially over over the uh, polar regions as we <clears throat> take into account the o ocean and the glaciers uh, in terms of reflecting solar radiation. But, 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 even, but, 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 but these are substantial changes in the climate system. And this is what you used in the IPCC in the latest calculations. <clears throat> I don't. Uh, my next comment is something that's that you would agree with. I think uh, now President Trump. I don't believe in climate change. Well, he doesn't offer any alternative. Uh, uh, is there something missing in our hypothesis? Is anything missing in the fact that? And we see a gradual warming of the climate system. I don't know. <clears throat> I, I wish I could be more optimistic about his statement. He hasn't articulated what he doesn't believe in. Some of the changes you might be expecting, and here we've seen uh, essentially precipitation changes. I won't go through these in any great detail. But we've, we've already seen evidence of heavy downpours uh, in the precipitation. And it's caused partly by the fact that over the certain areas that we have more water vapor in the atmosphere. And that leads to heavier precipitation rates. Uh, here's the changes that we see. And it's been increasing dramatically. And that's going to cause more and more damage, especially in the coastal areas. Here we show uh, observed changes in the very heavy precipitation. And the, like in some of these areas, you, you're getting a very substantial increase of precipitation and, and extreme weather. <clears throat> By extreme weather, I'm talking about things like heat waves and, 
and tornadoes and so forth. So it's increasing. Cold waves have become less frequent <clears throat> and less intense over parts of the nation. Here's the difference in warm waves and cold waves, <clears throat> the number of days. And I'll show you some animations in a few minutes about changes in hurricanes. Because we act actually, with high enough resolution models, are able to generate realistic st st statistics on, clim on uh, hurricanes. So it's the changes in the hurricanes, that they're stronger now, and we have maybe fewer uh, hurricanes. It's, uh, one of the biggest changes is in the strength of hurricanes. Here I show uh, animation of, of the gradual warming <coughs> for, for two time periods. One is the present, and the next one is, is the, uh, at the end of this century, the last decade. So you've seen uh, the present is at the top, so there's actually warming and cooling <coughs> taking place. As this gets warmer, it, it's more often warming than cooling. At the bottom, you can see it's warmed sub substantially more. <coughs> and that's what we are worried about. So that, so that we can give this to the planners, the people who are doing, doing the, the national climate assessment, and others as a source of information. It's not perfect, but it's, but it's come a long ways in giving uh, information to developers and the cities and states and so forth, so they can anticipate what the changes might be and how much. <clears throat> Uh, now here I show uh, an uh, animation of hurricanes for the present and hurricanes for the, for, for, for the future. <clears throat> You'll see this in a second. Here's on the present, and so the, the, the water vapor is running around 50 or 60. For, for the precipital water, which is the total amount of water in the vertical column. <clears throat> and down here, and we're seeing that we're up to 75 or 144 or 100 kilograms per meter squared. So <clears throat> as the seasons go, you can see that there's much more water vapor in the atmosphere. And <clears throat> here, as we're getting into uh, May, this, this, this is the, the month here, <clears throat> um, we're finding stronger hurricanes hitting in the, in the Pacific, also starting to get indication of hurricanes, <clears throat> and more stronger over here in the Atlantic. <clears throat> These storms are very realistic. They even have no open centers where it's clear, and they have rain bands and so forth. <clears throat> As we get into August and so forth, we see these hurricanes become stronger in the Pacific and also in the Atlantic. And we look at the statistics that we get from running the model of Albertus's observations. And you know, Mal does a pretty good job of actually capturing the, the frequency and the intensity of hurricanes. I think, uh, the, just remember that this is water vapor that we're looking at. And it's very simple. You warm up the ocean, it puts more water vapor, in, it evaporates more water vapor into the atmosphere, and then the atmosphere then 
responds by increasing the number and the intensity of hurricanes. So this is well known. I'll talk a little bit about geoengineering. Uh, um, we have been making progress in some areas, like solar panels and, and uh, uh, wind uh, uh, capturing on the wind speed and making progress. But there's other ideas that people have put forward. For example, space mirrors. Uh, high altitude surface injection where you fly airplanes up and drop uh, uh, sulfur compounds in the upper, in the lower stratosphere. Seeding stratocumulus type clouds, those are the types of clouds that you get here in, in, uh, here in the, in the Midwest or in <clears throat> in this part of the of the of the atmosphere, sequestration of CO2, and I'll talk a little bit about that in in, in detail. Iron fertilization of the ocean. Now, all of these have some negative aspects to them, and and we're quite aware. But I think the scientific community is is offering some ideas that haven't been fully tested and even even pilot studies. The idea is to start working on these things now, and hopefully, if we really need them in the future, that we'll have them ready to be put into production. Here's uh, the, the, the future. And, and it represents several things. Uh, one is, the, on the red line, excuse me, on, the, uh, on this orange line is, the, is, the, is our, a, a graph showing observed measurements and also from some of the modeling studies. <clears throat> and if we don't do anything, um, we get this red line going all the way up. So it could warm up to six degrees Fahrenheit, uh, I mean centigrade, over this next uh, 50 or 60 or 70 years. Uh, here we also show some attempts at cutting back on the em emissions of, of greenhouse gases, and you can have a level off. If you want to really improve the climate back to, to where it was, you have to re, re, reduce the, 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 the amount of greenhouse gases so that it goes down in the future. And I think a lot of scientists are fairly skeptical of that being possible, but they're willing to keep open-minded about it. <clears throat> Unfortunately, um, we I haven't really made much progress as we hoped to, to have made. Then we looked into uh, uh, to how to avoid catastrophic climate change. This is from, from Phil Rasher's work. He's at the, at the Pacific Northwest Laboratory, the DOE laboratory. <clears throat> And he, he brought in several different ways to do it. And some are more doable than others. We're, we, I don't think there's anybody who's actually proposing for that geoengineering be, be done in a serious way. And uh, there are implications that we should, should think about. And here's from an academy study that, that I helped monitor to make sure it's as, as, as sound as we could to look at different techniques of geoengineering. Uh, 
coastal blue, which essentially is making changes in the wetlands uh, along the coast and, and the dry lands to start contributing to taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Uh, and, and this has been pr proposed with cost e estimates to sort of do this. So that was one part of the, the academy study. Here's, um, we use terrestrial carbon removal and sequestration afforestation, put in trees where we, where we should put in more trees. As we're flying in, in here a couple of days ago, I noticed that clear cutting is still going on uh, here in the West. Maybe that's not a good idea because it really causes less carbon to be captured by the forest. But anyway, we'll see what, what happens. And, and bioenergy from carbon capture and sequestration, this is to use technology to actually get out of plant bio, our biomass, more capturing of, of the CO2. Direct air capture. Uh, we've looked into this, and we and there's been some ways to to actually just have a fan system and chemistry actually take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. But it turns out, when you do the economics of this, it's very expensive. So so it's not something that's probably feasible. Uh, here's uh, carbon mineralization. It turns out, and I learned a little bit of geology here, that there are certain rocks that will attach to carbon dioxide and take it out of the, of the, of the environment. But here again, it's fairly expensive because you have to do a lot of drilling and, and pumping of, of CO2 underground. But there are some places in the world where the, the, on the rocks can absorb the CO2. And on the geologic sequestration is that we just can, can pump some of the carbon dioxide back underneath the ground and just in places where it'll stay for, for centuries. Here again, it's expensive. And another thing which emphasizes something that's been talked about a lot is, is uh, flying aerocraft carrying certain aerosols and, and releasing them so that they act like many volcanic eruptions and that would you know, take CO2 out of the atmosphere. Uh, I'm not advocating that because it has some downsides also. What are the Americans thinking about climate change? Well, it's actually, this isn't quite up to date, but roughly almost 70% now think that climate change is happening. And uh, we need to do more about it and change our way of doing things. And, and being more efficient is one of them. And just cut back on the, on, uh, the use of, of, uh, of, of uh, in our activities using less carbon, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. I think that we're making some progress in that, but it's not as good as, as it should be. I'll just say a little bit about diversity. Uh, I want to point out that I'm very pleased when I looked at some of the, of the data from diversity efforts here at Oregon State. I see that we have made progress. And I think at the time I was here, there were more students, African-American students in, on, the, on the football team than they were just as ordinary students like me. Uh, but I think we're catching up and making real progress in that 
in this fee, in the in the fields, and our student body is much more diverse than than it was previously. I uh, give a little advice to young scientists: continue to develop your expertise, contribute to larger efforts, as well as as do what you. Are, are involved in. So there are many ways you can, con you can con contribute to many of the activities here at the, at the college. And uh, I, I benefited from the fact that I spent my, my, my last year here working with, with the biochemists and doing experiments. I learned how to do science. I learned a little bit about how to take, you know, careful measurements and so forth. And that's important. I think you've got to have that experience for all the students who are working in the laboratories and elsewhere. <coughs> Continue to learn. That's imp very important. And seek out leadership opportunities and, and so forth. Here's, here's some uh, national st 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 statistics on, on men and women in S&E occupations. We are making some progress with women, but we still have a long way to go. And this represents underrepresented minorities, still pretty small, and in the various areas of science and engineering and so forth. Here you, and can you find jobs after graduations, which is a very important issue. <laughs> and there are opportunities out there. And you just need to be a very uh, clear in, in, in seeing where things are going. There are a lot of programs which will help you get through your education. NSF has many, and DOE, and I and many other agencies. So uh, I'll be assured that people like myself are retiring, <laughs> and they're going to be replaced with, with young, new faces. In the scientific society, such as the AAAS, AMS, AGU, APS, A American Chemical S Society, are, are heavily involved. So you use these, these, uh, these uh, different organizations to kind of give you information about where the jobs are being generated. Problems still exist. Transition from high school and, and, and being prepared for college is still a problem. In the STEM carrier areas, there's still our major weaknesses in math and science background skills. So we have to keep, keep working on improving that. In my childhood in high school, I won't go through all of these things, but I want to point out that I knew I wanted to be a scientist even before I, I went to high school. I just was turned on by reading the stories in the library. And my mother got me a library card, and that was like a gift from God, <laughs> because then I could read about scientists, what they did. And I discovered that they had ordinary family life. And I could ask myself, I can do that too. <laughs> and I think that that was important to get in my mind, to say that I wanted to, you know, to be a scientist. And I think I've mentioned this to some of the students that I've talked with. When I first came to OSU, my science advisor said to me, I think, Warren, that you ought to go into business and not into science. I proved him wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I told him I still wanted to be a scientist. I, I, for me, he didn't give me the the right information of encouragement. He gave me a, he was afraid I wouldn't do, do well. Turned out that in high school and, 
in chemistry and mathematics. I did quite well at, at high school, so I knew I could do something. So anyway, I think you have to be careful of getting advice from people that are, just are afraid to, you know, say that you can be a scientist or an engineer or whatever. Uh, and I, I, I encourage, uh, well, I worked with Akira Kasahara, an excellent Japanese scientist, on, the, on building the, the first models. He was an excellent mentor. He and I had good experience working with mathematicians at several different institutions, uh, so that we were successful even with our first models, <coughs> that they worked. <laughs> And there were significant opportunities in other areas that you should explore. Let me, I'm getting close to the end here. The 2009 National Medal of Science to Warren M. Washington, National Center for Atmospheric Research, for his development and use of global climate models to understand climate and explain the role of human activities and natural processes in the Earth's climate system and for his work to support a diverse science and engineering workforce. Okay, now one of the things that, that was special for that time, I was this is, sitting right in back of, of, of President Obama. And it, it gave me some turmoil in my mind because his shoestrings were untied. <laughs> I, thought, I thought that he would stumble and I would be at fault. <laughs> but uh, I didn't think I wanted to embarrass him by uh, uh, you know, tell them, you know, tie your shoestring. <laughs> Fortunately, when we got through the whole thing, but it was interesting, Mary was with me. I mean, Mary's my wife, they're not, not there. Uh, and Mary was with me when, when we first met Obama. This was before this, this event. And uh, he invited me to give a Although I'll be on the panel with him and several others uh, to explain about climate change, how important it was. It turned out that he had read the, the, the documents that were generated by the panel. And I'm, he, I'm sitting in my seat. He spoke before I was, he gave all of my talk. <laughs> I, I told him, I said, well, well, when I was standing out there waiting for the medal to come, I told him, I kind of whispered to him, and you gave me, and you, you, you gave my talk last time. <laughs> and he laughed, and uh, I laughed too. <laughs> he has a good sense of humor. It turns out that when you get the National Medal of Science, they have a little custom um, of going to, the, to a room on the blue room, which is right off of the east, east room, in, in which you get 15 minutes or so, one on one with the president. And we chatted about that and other things. And he was, he was in great spirits. He actually was involved in selection process, because he thought that the National Medal was an award that required the president to really uh, contribute to the selection of the people. And he also thought that, that the National Medal should be uh, given for people who, who not only do good science, but engineering and, and, and technology and so forth. So he spread it out. Turns out that the, that the two inventors, after I was through with them, with the, with the process when they asked me to go over to the executive office building and take a, a
conference call with 800,000 kids. <laughs> you know, and, and, and one of them was the inventor of the digital camera. Uh, and another one was the inventor of superglue. Now, it turns out that, uh, and I have two daughters who are, who are doctors. And one's a doctor, one's a nurse with a PhD. And, and it turned out that th th they use superglue all the time. And in the, in the, in the, in the, in the military, they use superglue to stop pe people from bleeding. And they do it also in just medical practice. So I think these were also important contributions. Uh, so it was just an interesting time to kind of get, with someone like Obama, who has a real serious attitude about science and so forth. It was, it was nice to get it from him. I probably wouldn't have gotten it. I probably wouldn't have gotten it from Trump, I think. <laughs> Now, this is a, a, a PBS show. I was interviewed by Ralph Cicerone, the president of the National Academy of Sciences, in an hour-long taping that was played on, on uh, uh, public radio. So that was, that was, that was the thing. It's, it was called The Night with Warren Washington. And here's from uh, uh, Joe Biden and uh, myself getting honorary degrees uh, from Kobe College in Maine. And at the bottom it says, Dear Warren, congratulations. We need you more than ever over the, uh, we, <laughs> we must turn over the wood. Good. I see you can read it. He sent me this over about a year ago. I got to know him fairly well, uh, on, even on that one day, because we wandered around, just like I wandered around here, <laughs> meeting students and talking to students and so forth and so on. And he clearly, I, I'm not pushing him in a political sense, because there are many other candidates who are clearly qualified to, to be president, especially now that we've lowered the... the <laughs> <laughs> I won't say it. <laughs> but anyway, hopefully things will get better in the future. I think I'd like to end right here. Thank you. Thank you. I want to leave you with just one one note. I want to thank you all in the Oregon State University for giving me the, the Lifetime Award. I really am appreciation. I'm appreciating how much uh, Oregon State gave me to get started in, as a scientist, and it really felt good to come back. Thank you. Questions if you're uh, willing to take a few. Sure. Okay, so there is a microphone over there, a microphone over here, and people can just line up. And we'll just do alternating questions back and forth. Hi, Jim. Hi, Jim. I see Jim Coakley down here. <laughs> Old colleague. Or I can bring a microphone and hand it in. My name is 
name's Ebu, and I have a question about the, um, the climate model um, concerning hurricanes for the future. Did the model show that hurricanes were going to happen like in the Pacific Northwest region? I don't know. <laughs> no. No, I don't think you're going to be worried about hurricanes for a long time. Because uh, the changes that we see is the hurricanes are, are actually becoming more intense in the usual places that you find them, like in the, Medi the, in the, in the southern states and on the east coast. Because uh, we understand th that these large circulations, like the high pressure or low pressure, really don't... Uh, uh, change in between now and the future. Uh, and, and we think that, that even with climate change, it's not going to uh, make Oregon a lot more rainier. Uh, it'll probably change on the rainfall uh, pattern, but, but certainly not more hurricanes hitting Oregon. Good evening. Uh, this uh, late this summer, I had the opportunity to visit Glacier Bay National Park in Alaska. And the Park Service had given us uh, a map of Glacier Bay showing where the glaciers were, say, in about 1800, and the meltdown that occurred over about the next, well, to, to present. And there's a large meltdown from about 1800, you know, over the next 100 years or so to, say, 1900. Okay. Do you have any insights as to what was going on there? Well, I think the thing on the storm system seemed to be going into Alaska more vigorously than it used to. So, so that's one change that we see. The permafrost, of course, is melting faster and leading to, uh, uh, you know, sort of affecting buildings that are built up there, as you might expect. I think in general, we're just going to see it four or five degrees warmer than it is now by the end of this century. And so it, that's a major change. And the seasons are going to be shorter uh, in terms of, of, of winter being shorter and summer being longer. <coughs> Hi, Dr. Washington. Thanks uh, for taking my question. Uh, I had a question. You were talking about hurricanes. And one of the things you mentioned was uh, that strength for hurricanes would increase. But, and I don't know if my notes are off here, but you also mentioned that there would be fewer. And I was wondering why that would be. Yeah, we see a slight trend of, of, of fewer. Uh, because the reason, I suppose, is is the general areas that the hurricanes form in. The first step is a, a warming up of the, of the top of the ocean. And then that puts more water vapor into the atmosphere, and that causes storms to be more intense. But the location of the hurricanes doesn't change much, uh, except, except that you look at the East Coast, a few years back, we had Sandy. Sandy was right off the coast of New Jersey and, and uh, Manhattan. And it actually caused a tremendous amount of damage because the ocean water at that time was three or four degrees warmer, you know, centigrade, than, than previously. So, that, so, the, so the, on the warming, will change the position of the hurricanes a little bit, but not completely. In other words, I don't expect Washington State and Oregon are going to get hurricanes very often. <clears throat> That's all I can say at this point. Thank you for your lecture this afternoon. I appreciate it. Um, the ocean um, the report the IPCC indicated that uh, the number of, uh, of one-seventh of an inch per year 
when poachings are rising. Mm -hmm. But that number varies widely yes. around the globe. Right. I, I, I would love to, and maybe it's published. I'd like to see that data put on a globe. Okay. To see, to see if any of those measurements coincide with movements of the tectonic plates. Yeah, I think that the, the source that you may want to look up is the documents with the uh, from the IPC uh, source. And the IPC is the Intergovernmental Panel on, on Global Change, or, or Climate Change. And just looking through that data, because it's going to include the best observational data we have, as well as what the models are showing. And I think it's a good source of what we know and don't know, and, we, and still have questions about. But uh, we're finding, in general, the, the, the warming patterns that we're seeing are basically pretty close to the observations that we're also seeing. So there isn't any big disagreement between the models and what the observations are telling us. Uh, and we also keep in mind that we're dealing with a, a climate system that has a certain amount of, of uh, chaos theory embedded. In other words, if we take one of our simulations of the, of the present and go to the future, and then we uh, sort of do it for you know, 10 other places where we start the model. And we actually get 10 different solutions, but they're generally along, the, I mean, just like with hurricane forecasting, it actually shows a, a, a panel of, 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 of possible paths of, towards warming, and, and they all grow with time, but they don't look exactly the same. And, and, and part of that's due to the chaos theory. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Washington. Thank you for being here. It was really a pleasure to hear you speak. Um, I have maybe a different sort of question. I wonder what, um, what kind of lifestyle factors do you think the average person could uh, choose or control that would have the biggest impact on climate change? Wow. <laughs> I think we're seeing it even almost daily. You turn on the evening news and what do you see? Tornadoes hitting the Midwest, stronger and more prevalent than ever. We're seeing that the hurricanes are causing more damage, and not just ordinary damage. Uh, like in, in Puerto Rico and, and, uh, and other parts of the Caribbean, Atlantic, we're seeing storms that, you, that we used to think aren't going to be causing much damage, and they cause more damage than we thought. So I think that, that the extremes are becoming the, the normals. And that's unfortunate. I'm, we have to be somewhere else at 7 o'clock, so oh. I'm afraid I'm going to, I'm going to stop the questions there. And I, let's just all take another moment to thank Dr. Washington for coming back.